Now, we're not going to be in John 13, 1. That would be way back down here. But where are we going to be? Where are we going to be? I think we started talking about that. I was trying to remember uh, what I talked about. Luke 22. Oh, go ahead and open up your Bible to, to Luke um, 13. Is technically where we are. You know me. We're not going to be in one place too long. Luke 13. The supper being ended. The devil having now put it into the heart. Of Judas Iscariot. Simon's son to betray him. He put it into his heart. In that verse. And then we find later in. Luke 22. Um, that. Uh, in verse 3, then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being one of the number of the twelve. And I want you to think about that for a minute. Because my, my firm belief is that everything in the Bible is a prophecy. It's not just a historic account of what happened 2,000 years ago, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, so on. Although those things did happen, those things happened for our admonition and our learning. And they are a shadow of things to come, the Bible says. So, uh, Judas Iscariot, there's only two people in the Bible who were given the title, Son of Perdition. Now, perdition means hell. Perdition is destruction, it means hell. One of them is Second Thessalonians chapter 2, the man of sin, the son of perdition, which is the Antichrist, who... Um, sinneth as God, sinneth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And yet he's not God. He's not the son of God. He's the son of hell itself. Hell gave birth to a child. There are types and illustrations of this all through the Bible. One of, one of my favorite ones is Ichabod. Ichabod was a child. He, he, his name means the glory has departed. And the birth of Ichabod represented the fact because the Ark of the Covenant had been taken away and stolen by the Philistines, that God's glory and His presence has now left the people of Israel. And when that child was born, it's just like 2 Thessalonians 2 tells us. And then shall that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. You know, back before the days of, uh, what is it, ultrasound? Back before the days of ultrasound, we had to wait. Remember the, those days when the doctor would come out and say, it's a boy. Right? Remember Who remembers those days? And we all go, oh, it's a boy. Okay. Nowadays, they come out and say, it is a human. But we don't want to enforce any sort of gender identity upon this child until this child is ready to select their... Anyway. Bunch of nonsense. But anyway... Um, Ichabod is a type of the Antichrist. He's, he, you can't see who he is. Now when he's born, he's revealed. And his name, Ichabod, literally means the glory has departed. It means that God has left the scene. He's left the man of sin now to be in charge. The son of perdition. So Judas is the other one who is called son of perdition. There's only two of them in the Bible. It's called Son of Perdition. And Antichrist is one, Judas is the other. So, 
it makes me think. It makes me think about the identity of the Antichrist. I mean, it says back here in Luke 22, Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. He was one of them. He was an inside man. He was, uh, I, what do they, I guess, a, a certain kind of spy. Huh? Well, a double agent would be, I guess it could be, a double agent is a Russian who is acting as a Russian spy and he's supposedly spying on America. But really, he is giving Russia bad information and he's spying on Russia for us while he's a, so that's what, that's what you're thinking of, I think. But basically, the man of sin, the son of perdition is on the inside. Church people, and I say that term in opposition to saying born again Christians, because the two of them aren't always the same. Church people are going to be deceived because somehow, some way, this man of sin, this Judas, is going to be related in some big way to churchianity or to Christianity. Although not saved, not born again. But he was one of them. And that kind of freaks you out, doesn't it? Okay? And, you know, it, it sometimes... I, I think, and you'll have to forgive me, just comes from years of, you know, people walking out on me, people getting mad at me, people calling me names and making YouTube videos on me and stuff like that. Every now and then, I think, I wonder if the devil's going to send some sort of agent in amongst our church to watch what we're doing. If you just want to watch what we're doing, just watch what we're doing. We don't really do anything when the camera's off. When the camera goes off, we don't go, okay, now into the secret ritual that we talked about earlier. Let's go. Okay, we, we just don't do that. Uh, Luke 22, 1, now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him. And they feared the people. Then entered Satan into Judas, surname Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. And he went his way and, and communed with the chief priests and captains, how they might betray him unto them. And they were glad and co covenanted with and gave him money. And they promised and sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. Now, back to John chapter 13. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit. Now, listen to me. Joel Osteen can come out with that big $150,000 dental work smile of his. And make you think that everything in his life is absolutely glorious. But he's lying through them $150,000 dental work teeth. He's lying through them. Not everything. He's, when he's not on camera, what kind of man is he? Listen. I've met enough people who have worked for Joyce Myers 
to tell you. You know somebody? To tell you. She's a witch. And I'm not trying to make that rhyme with something, although it would work. I'm telling you, she's a witch. She is a hateful, arrogant, pushy, Jezebel, the queen of all Jezebels. That's her in real life. Okay? And, um, but anyway, if these people try to make you think that as a Christian, you should never have those doubts and you should never have those down days. You can just think and declare them to be gone and they will be gone. Look at your Bible. When Jesus had thus said he was troubled in spirit. Jesus was having a freak out moment. Troubled. And testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Now Jesus knew all of this from before the foundation of the earth. But now here it is in living color right now. And it's about to happen. And we see later as he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, how basically he just loses it out there. We're talking about God himself being troubled in his spirit, shaking. Shaking. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples. Does anybody know who that is? There was one leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples. Who was that? Why do you say that? Huh? John always described himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now he wrote of himself that way. And some might say, well, he's being arrogant. Or that shows you that John didn't really write that. Because John wouldn't have written that. But John did. John, John is. And we had this, we had this declared, we had this prophesied by Jesus. Remember when, um, I can't remember how it was done. But Jesus told John that he would live until he saw the kingdom of God. And Peter's like, why are you doing that for him? Peter, what, what is it to thee that I do that for him? His life is in my hand. Your life is in my hand. You're both going to die, but you're both going to see glory. Now, some scholars will take that verse, that phrase, that John will not die until he sees the kingdom of heaven or sees the kingdom of God. And they say, therefore, we are already in the kingdom of God. And they will dismiss the book of Revelation as a prophecy. They will say that it's already happened. But that's not what Jesus was getting at. Did John see the kingdom of heaven? Yeah, he wrote about it in the book of Revelation. He described the whole thing in the book of Revelation. God let him see the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, with his own eyes. And he wrote about it. And then John was up in his 90s. And soon after that, he died. But he saw it. And John was the only disciple that we know of who died a natural death. All of the others, from Paul and all of the original apostles, they all died a martyr's death. 
But Jesus really loved John. And when you read John's gospel, it comes out. That I've mentioned this before in relation to DNA, that John is written differently. And it is. You read John and you can see that there is, there is a di whole different flavor to John's writing of, of Jesus' gospel than the other three writers. It's altogether different. Okay? So anyway, um, verse 24, Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it would be of him he, he spake. He then lying on Jesus' breast saith unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop. Remember they have bread. And you see this a lot. Well, you see it a lot in America. We call it dipping your Oreos in milk. That's we sop. Okay? Or dipping your biscuits in gravy. Okay? Or scooping up the egg yolk with your toast. Amen. Am I making you hungry? Yeah, roast beef. And I you just gulp the au jus. Amen. Just suck it down. Um, but that's where we get the word supper is from the word sop. And they, they do it a lot in Kenya with uh, what is it they make with Ugali? First time she said that, I almost slapped her. She, she said, are you ugly? She, she said, no, ugali. I said, oh, okay. But anyway, they take their ugali, which is from corn, and they, they dip it into their, their stew that they just made and, and eat it that way. And that's, that's how it's done. That's why we get corn and beans um, and at one time we got them goats there in Turkana uh, because they make the ugali out of the corn and they use that to sop and dip things up with it and so on. But anyway, um, it, is, it is to him I, sh I shall give a sop and when I have dipped it and when he dipped the sop he gave it to Judas Iscariot the son of Simon and after the sop Satan entered into him, then said Jesus unto him, that thou doest, do quickly. And, and again, he just told his disciples, who's it going to be? And he said, to whoever I give the, the sop to. So he dips it down, gives it to Judas. Now, he said, whatever you're going to do, do quickly. Now, why didn't the other disciples figure it out? I think is because God withheld it from their mind, from their knowledge, from their seeing it. I do believe that. I think God at times withholds knowledge from us until such a time when it's pertinent. And then when we see it, we go, Oh my goodness! He told us He was going to do that! Why didn't we get that before? You know, I've had that happen so many times, you know, was studying things and uh, I'll read a chapter or something out of the Bible I've read a thousand times and I'll see something in there never saw before ever. And I'm going, oh, look at that. Never seen that before in my life ever. Isn't that great? And there's nobody around to hear me do this. So it makes me feel better. But anyway, I love that. But why didn't... Why didn't they figure it out? I think God withheld it from them. Jesus told them, I'm going to be crucified. Three days later, I'm going to rise again from the dead. And they went, yeah, what time is it anyway? What's for supper? They, it's like they went, it went right over their heads. But the day that they went to the tomb and didn't find Jesus, they went, he told us this. He told us this was going to happen. There are things that are in the Old Testament that when God reveals them to the people of Israel to whom He has selected, you're going to hear the biggest shout, I think, in the world. I think that's probably when the rapture is going to take place. You're going to hear Jews shouting 
at the things that are coming into their mind now from the Old Testament about who the Messiah is and the fact that Jesus qualifies in every way for their Messiah. Oh, amen to that. Um, this, is, this is about betrayal. I'm going to move on from this. Uh, stories about betrayal. John 13, I think we've talked about that too, about, um, let me look at, let me, yeah, let's do this. John 13, 4, he rises from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. And after that, he poured water into a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. And again, here we have the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. The one to whom every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. And yet here his knee is bowed to every one of these men and he washed their feet. But I, I think it's, let's see here. No. Let's see here. No, he's still here. Judas at this time is still with the twelve. Jesus even washed the feet of the man who was going to have him crucified. That's love. That is love. That's loving. Listen to this now. That is loving people that the love is unjustified. There's no reason to love them. There's no reason why you should even like them. You know what they have what they have said about you behind your back. You know the deal that he's made. You know that he is going to betray you. You know that he's going to come and kiss you and have that Judas kiss. You know that Judas go hang himself. But then you get down on your knees and you wash his feet. Because when God said, God so loved the world, he, he meant the whole world. Even the people that hated him and hate him now. The people that hate him now Jesus died for them. That is unconditional love. And it would, we would, we would ask ourselves, shouldn't we have that kind of love? Yeah, we should, but do we? No, that's why there can only be one Savior. That's why there can only be one man on the cross. That's why none of us would ever qualify. Because none of us would ever wash Judas' feet. We'd just never do it. Okay? Um, in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 6, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Watch this. In other words, we know things that none of the princes of this world know. For had they known it, they would have not have crucified the Lord of glory. So here's Satan. He's got a plan. He's going to enter into Judas Iscariot. He is going to have Judas, for 30 pieces of silver, betray Christ. And then he's going to run away. And they're going to arrest Jesus Christ. And they're going to crucify him. Judas is going to be 30 pieces of silver richer. And he doesn't believe that this Jesus is the Messiah anyway. So why am I following this guy around? I can't stand him. I hate his guts. But that's Satan's plan. 
Satan's plan is to enter into somebody that's weak. And he found Judas and he entered into him and he set this whole thing in motion. He thinks. He thinks that he's the one who originated the idea of crucifying Christ. But it wasn't his idea. It was God's idea. God is the one who set all the pieces in motion. God is the one who you never want to play checkers with. I mentioned checkers because I don't like chess. I've played chess. But playing a game where number one, I'm going to lose. And number two, it's going to take hours and hours and hours for this person to beat me. I got no interest in it. However, checkers, is I can win that sometimes. But you never want to play checkers with God. Shoot, you wouldn't want to play tic-tac-toe with God. And that's the easiest game in the world to tie ever. And yet God would beat you every time. So God is the one who set this whole thing in motion by crucifying Christ on the cross. And he hid it. Even though the Bible says that Satan is wiser than Daniel. That he, his knowledge and his wisdom excel that of any other angel or any beast or any human. And yet he can't see where this is all going. He can't figure out why God is letting him crucify his only begotten son. But he's going to do it. Because he thinks that's going to bring him God's kingdom. And that will cause the prophecies of the Old Testament to fail. Therefore, God's a liar and I'll take over. But none of the princes, no devil ever figured it out. Satan never figured it out. Had they figured it out, one devil would have come running to Satan and saying, Satan, Satan, stop, stop, stop the soldiers. Don't kill him. Whatever you do, don't kill him. <sighs> we just heard some of the angels talking. And this whole thing was put together by God. And if you kill him, it's going to be the destruction of you. Oh, boy, I'm glad you brought that to my attention. But none of them figured it out. None of them did. And the whole thing happened the way God wanted it to. And I want you to take that remark that I made and I want you to put that in your mind somewhere and hang on to it. The whole thing happened exactly the way God wanted it to. Because one of these days, you're going to need that. You're going to need the whole thing happen the way God wanted it to. Okay? And that's going to help you. It'll save you. Might even save you from putting a bullet in your head. But the whole thing happened the way God wanted it to. And when you get that in your heart, it makes life and this life here a little bit easier to live through. Amen. Um, let's take some prayer requests.